In the year 1284, a mysterious man appeared in Hamel. My name's SJ. And my name's T. And we're Crumbs of Science, a podcast about the science in and around fairy tales. So today we're talking about the Pied Piper of Hamelin, a Brothers Grimm fairy tale which was first published in 1816, but the story dates back well before that. There's a lot of evidence showing that this event that occurs in the Pied Piper of Hamelin actually happened. So to give you a rough idea of what was going on around the world uh, in the late 13th century... Marco Polo was making his journeys around the globe. The Ottoman Empire had just been founded and King Edward I was on the throne in England. The story of the Pied Piper continues. He was wearing a coat of many coloured bright cloth, for which reason he was called the Pied Piper. He claimed to be a rat catcher and he promised that for a certain sum that he would rid the city of all mice and rats. The citizens struck a deal, promising him a certain price. The rat catcher then took a small fife from his pocket, which is a little musical instrument, a bit like a flute or a recorder today, and began to blow on it. Rats and mice immediately came from every house and gathered around him. When he thought that he had them all, he led them to the River Wesser, where he pulled up his clothes and walked into the water. The animals all followed him, fell in, and drowned. So here's the thing about... Uh, training rats to do things. Uh, they can be rats can be trained, but the, I mean people do train rats for all sorts of things. Uh, scientists use them in labs. They, the rats are very, really smart and they're used for analogs for humans um, because we have quite similar physiology physiological reactions to things, um, and they can be trained. Could I train rats to follow me when I played my flute? You could train rats to follow you. Yes, but yeah, yeah you couldn't train them to follow you because you were playing a flute or a, a fife or a whatever you've got on hand. Um, because when you're training rats, um, it's all about quite simple stimuli and quite simple command. So there's an article in the New York Times uh, yeah. from 2016 by Ma- Malia Woolen, and she interviewed a guy called Mark Harden from Animals for Hollywood. And the way they train the rats is they reward them with food. And they, uh, when they perform an action after a simple trigger, like a click or a light going on, something like that. Do you think that if I laid food in front of rats that they would run, if I put enough food in, they'd run into water and, and die? I don't think so. Like we said, they're actually quite smart. They're not as, yeah, they're not that dumb. So they couldn't sew me a dress and... They probably wouldn't follow me when I play my flute. That's very unexciting. Music does actually affect rats, though. It does. You, it's not so much useful for training them, but if you want to change the way rats behave or the, their physiology, a 2018 review of 42 different studies on rats found that rats really were affected. Music, listening to music increased the neuroplasticity of the brain, so the brain's ability to reprogram itself, um, it improved their ability to learn, it reduced their anxiety... Uh, it also affected them physically as well. And it, they tried a b- bunch of different types of music as well. I was just I was trying really hard to find a joke for what, <laughs> for what was a favourite uh, rat's favourite music, but sadly I don't have anything yet. Well, science says a uh, rat's favourite music is uh, classical music. Um, they use specifically, it's a very specific Mozart tune, yeah. which we'll play for you now. It's a particular composition of Mozart's. I feel like Mozart usually had more creatively named Yeah, this wasn't one of his music. bigger ones. Oh. I think scientists just really like using this one. But they've also used okay. uh, house music. Um, yeah. Listening to house music improved the rat's serotonin levels. Rock music. That, that, that very much confuses me because house music does not improve anything for me <laughs> other than my desire to leave the place where house music is being played. Um, they're listening to rock music uh, lowered the blood pressure of the rats. Uh, listening to the prodigy. Um, listen, a lowered anxiety. Very specific. Hopefully, it was a scientist's favorite. <laughs> I wonder how much effort went into deciding specifically mm. Prodigy was yeah. what was needed. Uh, I'd also all... like to know what Taylor Swift. <laughs> they also listened to Nightwish as well. I've for... never even heard of them. Really? What oh. type of music is that? Yeah, like? it's like a goth pop 
high fantasy. How do I? Do... That do you those want... words let's just... often don't go together. Let's just play some Nightwish. I feel like that's going to be copyrighted. <laughs> so we know what type of music a rat's favorite, or at least which changed their brains a bit. But what is a rat's favorite game? I don't know, SJ. What's a rat's favorite game? Hide and squeak. <sighs> <laughs> But anyway, so the story continues that once the citizens had been freed, it says specifically, of the plague, uh, so the plague of rats, they regretted having promised him so much money and using lots of excuses, they refused to pay him. So he went away bitter and angry, as you would if people had refused to pay you. But then he took it another step further and he returned on a specific date, June 26th, St. John's and St. Paul's Day, early in the morning at seven o'clock now dressed in a hunter's costume with a dreadful look on his face and wearing a red hat. He sounded his fife in the streets, but this time it wasn't rats and mice that came to him, but rather children, a great number of boys and girls from their fourth year on. Among them was the mayor's growing daughter. The swarm followed him and he led them into a mountain where he disappeared with them. So the Brothers Grimm, the way that they worked was that they went out and collected stories from around Europe and then just wrote them down. There was a window, a church window, in the city of Hamlin, which depicted a man playing an instrument, playing the flute or his fife, surrounded by children. And then I think it read in their town register that in the year 1284, after the birth of Christ, from Hameln were led away, 130 children born at this place, led away by a piper into a mountain. Now, that's part of the Brothers Grimm fairy tale, but it also was actually written in their town register, which is where he got the story from. The town of Hamlin still believes in this so much so that there's actually a street. What, it has a very German name, so I apologise for my pronunciation. Bungle Ossenstrass, which is known as the Street Without Drums, And this is the street, supposedly, where the children were last seen. And still, to this day, people aren't allowed to play music or dance there, to the point where if you were having a wedding procession and you had a band with you and you wanted to cross the street, all the musicians would have to stop playing, walk across the street, and then they could start on the other side. So they still really, really believe in this. So there's a couple of theories about what happened to these children, I'll admit. None of them are good. But before we hear the theories, let's take a look at the actual story. So the story says he played music and the children all followed him. So children are affected, like the science is, science says, basically, children are affected by music. And every few years, someone publishes an article saying, music is good for learning, music will make your child a genius, Uh, listening to Mozart in the womb will make your child the next Stephen Hawking. I have definitely heard this. However, there has only been one Stephen Hawking, and I somehow doubt that he was played. Mozart mm. in the womb. Mm. Yeah, but no. My kids yeah. are going to have Taylor Swift. Them, so <laughs> well, sorted. so here's the thing. We know it has an effect on children's development. Um, there was a review of 46 studies published in the uh, Frontiers in Psychology Journal um, that found that while they couldn't definitively say that music didn't have any effects, they also, it was unclear in every regard the specific effects of the music. But so, there's so many stories. Yeah, I know, yes, right? It must be true. Well, because there's, these studies get done all the time because we all want to know how to, like, how we can improve our children's development, how we can make, pe- make people smarter generally. Because some children are dumb. <laughs> but they found it was basically unclear whether music had any effect on motor skills, social skills, language skills, cognition, academic performance. There was <sighs> basically, you could, you could say Rats. that there really was... Is it really just homework? Yeah. I just think, doing your I, homework. I think just going to school, yeah, smart. being a good student would, oh, makes you a better student. That was pretty much so it. Upsetting. What about osmosis by putting your textbook under your pillow and then going I mean, to sleep that was, on it? I mean, that was my strategy for <laughs> many years. And it, it worked out, well, look, here we are. Oh, I don't think it actually worked. <laughs> sad to say I never remembered any of those. So, I needed. so music doesn't hypnotize children. That's probably pretty clear. What are the theories on how these children were taken? There have been lots of ideas about what could have happened to them. So one of the ideas is that they all died from the plague because the bubonic plague swept through Europe. However, this theory doesn't really stack up because the Black Death actually swept through Europe about 100 years later. It was pretty horrible. It did kill around a third of Europe. However, 
it's very unlikely that it did kill these children in Hamlin. So there's another theory that maybe the children were sent away from their parents because of the extreme poverty. There's some other theories that maybe the children were part of the mysterious dancing plague. So dancing plagues, the most famous one that I found was in 1518 in Strasbourg, where hundreds of citizens danced uncontrollably and supposedly unwillingly for days on end. And overall, it lasted for about two months before ending as it began. And I from the sounds of it, it's just people went out on the street and started dancing and wouldn't stop for anything. They would collapse when they were exhausted and then they'd just get up and start dancing again when they could. Were they, like, aware that they were dancing? Were they conscious? I feel like they were. There's a couple of explanations, some of them more plausible than others for these dancing plagues, like demonic possession. There's... Other ones like overheated blood, which I suppose was a diagnosis in the med- in medieval times because mm. I haven't heard of that. Um, mm. There's also eating some weird sustagens. There's that one theory about um, ergot, the, which is a psychedelic um, psychedelic fungus. That was the one that they thought might have been the um, the uh, Salem witch trials. Could have been a similar deal. Of, yeah, it basically, it gets into the water and then you drink the water and then it, you uh, experience altered states of consciousness. You uh, react in different ways but i reckon that one was they didn't really i uh, think that one was a good theory because not everyone would have reacted in the exact same way whereas the dancing plagues everyone just went out dancing the most accepted theory for dancing plagues was from the american medical historian john waller who believed that it was a form of mass psychogenic disorder which takes place under circumstances of extreme stress which once again makes sense living in the Middle Ages, was very, very stressful. So there was the idea that maybe these children were part of a dan- a random dancing plague, but once again, doesn't really stack up mm-hmm. because the most famous ones were around 15, 18, so that's a couple of hundred years later. The very, well, the last popular theory is that, once again, part of my German, that's Ossiedlung, which was the mass movement of German people eastwards to go colonize other countries which happened during the middle ages so then the theory is that the pied piper was a flamboyantly dressed recruiting officer and convincing the townspeople to leave and colonize eastern europe and this theory sort of backed up by later on in the brothers grim fairy tale that there's actually the line that says some say that the children were led into a cave and that they came out again in Transylvania. So that supports the theory. And there's a linguist, mm-hmm. Jürgen Udolf, who researched that the names from Hamlin may have found their way into modern day Polish names. So Poland, Transylvania, not that close really. Mm. But this is... Yeah, a, a linguistic link across the two. And the, I mean, there is a thing that... Uh, they may have referred to the townspeople as the children of the town as well in this in this original inscription that the brothers Grimm took a look at. It could have they could have been talking about adults. They're just saying the children of the town were led away rather than uh, not specifically meaning the young people of the town. How we didn't mention a really interesting part of this story is that today you always hear it as the children, the rats were killed and then the children were taken away. Yeah. But then the in the first from like when it actually happened from the 1200s through to the about maybe the 1600s the story was just about the children being taken away. The rats weren't actually part of it. That was added later. I think there was another story. No, I mean rat catchers were a huge thing. Like when especially when the Black Death came around, if you were if you could come into a town and get rid of their rats, people would sing songs about you. People would write stories about you. So Very it's and that and the uh, the Black Death was going going around in the 1300s. So both of these stories would have been old when the Brothers Grimm were collecting them. So it's entirely possible they just got mashed together. So, so this story has actually it's so popular. There's heaps and heaps of versions around the world. So there's versions from a couple of versions from Germany. There's versions from Denmark. There's versions from Austria where it's the rat catcher of Kronenberg. There's the Rat Hunter from Denmark. England had their own go with the Pied Piper of Newtown. There's also a version in Syria of Avicenna and the Mouse Plague at Aleppo. So this was a really big story in the Middle Ages and it's also pretty popular now. 
It's a bit. It's a pretty horrifying story. Yeah, so and, I don't quite know why it turns up so much. And here's the thing with the story is that it really doesn't. There's not really a moral. No, or usually it is, these stories yeah, are like children. Yeah. Be good and listen to your parents. But yeah, this but, one almost seems to be remember to pay people. Yeah, pretty much. It's <laughs> yeah. Don't don't stiff people, or they might take your children. Which that's a really extreme reaction. Yeah, oh, God, yeah. there are laws against that sort yeah. of thing now. I mean, as as a freelancer, I want to get paid, <laughs> but I'm not going to resort to kidnapping. <sighs> have to look after the children which oh. let's be honest just cost you more than you agreed to get paid um don't try to use rats for useful tasks is i think that's the main but message you could, we can train them to make my clothes mm. we can make them walk into water and die mm. not at all not at, not all. at all rats <laughs> ah, that, didn't even <laughs> plan that one one so thank you very much everyone hopefully you learned something or at least enjoyed listening to us blabber so we hope that you have a happily ever after at least until next week